Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final Thurber Dialogue on Democracy of Spring 2022. For all of you students out there, I hope your finals went well. And for all of you faculty out there, I hope your grading is going well, or at least that you're at least closer to being done than I am. For the rest of you, I hope you're happy that you didn't have to either take or grade any exams this week. I'm David Barker, the director of the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies here at AU, and we are very proud to sponsor this event as we are of all the Thurber Dialogues on Democracy. These dialogues are possible, of course, because of the vision and generosity of distinguished university emeritus professor Jim Thurber and his wife, Claudia Thurber, who are doing their part to preserve and strengthen the democratic cause, small d, through this series and in many other ways as well. Our moderator tonight is my colleague, Dr. Laura Paler, Associate Professor of Government here at AU. Professor Paler specializes on the political economy of development, political behavior, and political psychology in a diverse group of countries that include Indonesia, Colombia, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Lebanon, and the United States. She is currently a member of the Evidence in Governance and Politics Network, EGAP, and a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. Professor Paler is also a member of the Democratic Erosion Consortium, a network of faculty and students from over 60 universities around the world that combines teaching, research, and policy engagement in order to better understand threats to democracy in the US and abroad, and to better support the development of effective programs and policies to mitigate democratic erosion. Our guests of honor tonight are Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zablat the authors of How Democracies Die, which was a New York Times bestseller, was published in 25 languages, and has been widely praised by just about every respectable outlet that you've ever heard of. Former President Barack Obama listed it as one of his favorite books of 2018. Dr. Levitsky is David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government at Harvard University, where he is also the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. His research focuses on dem democratization, authoritarianism, and political parties, especially in Latin America, about which he has written or edited 11 other books and many dozens of journal articles and other publications. Dr. Zablat is Eaton Professor of Science of Government at Harvard University and Director of the Transformations of Democracy Group at the WZB Berlin, Berlin Social Science Center. He specializes in the study of Europe and the history of democracy. In addition to How Democracies Die, he is the author of two other books, including Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy with Cambridge 2017, which won several prizes, including the American Political Science Association's 2018 Woodrow Wilson Prize for the Best Book in Government and International Relations. In 2019, Dr. Zablat received the Berlin Prize from the American Academy in Berlin. Professors Levitsky and Zablat are currently working on another book, uh, which will uh, comment on the rise of and reaction against multiracial democracy in the United States. While Professor Paler is interviewing Professors Levitsky and Zablat tonight, any of you in the audience can submit a question for them at any time using the Q&A function on your screen. 
I will pick a few of those questions toward the end of our program and pose them, giving priority to questions from students. All right, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the virtual mic over to you. Laura, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, David. Um, and thank you, uh, Daniel and Stephen, for being here to talk about this very important topic of democratic erosion uh, and your very important book. Um, and I wanna to start tonight by talking about one of the main goals of this book, which is to put the United States in a comparative perspective. So you provide many examples of democratic erosion in countries like Venezuela, Turkey, and Hungary uh, to raise red flags about uh, recent events here in the United States. Uh, and I wanna start off by just asking, you know, what would you say to your critics who might say that there's limited value in comparing the US to, to other countries? Democracy here is more established. It's, it's much, uh, it has a much longer history and it's hard to learn from, from other countries for, for the United States uh, for these reasons. So what would you say to, to those critics? Frankly, Laura, I don't think we'd have to say much. I mean, in, back in 2018, when the book came out, that was that was a real issue. A lot of people thought that uh, one, we were being a little alarmist, and two, right, that that it, it's not. It seemed really far fetched that an elected leader would assault democratic institutions in the United States because that hadn't happened in in uh, many, many, many decades. But after what happened. Uh, between November 2020 and January 2021, I think it's pretty self-evident that uh, the United, that U.S. democracy is vulnerable uh, and, um, and 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 can experience some of the same assaults that we see in other parts of, and have seen in other parts of the world. We experienced what in Latin America we call a presidential self-coup attempt: a president, a sitting president, who tried to use the power of the presidency to undermine. The democratic order. Um, he failed, but um, I don't think there are, are many critics. I haven't heard recently many critics say uh, that somehow the U.S. is not comparable and is somehow immune to democratic erosion. That seems pretty clear at this point. Yeah, I would just add one other thing. I mean, I think it's by making by making that comparison that we can kind of point to this fact. I mean, this is something that is pretty clear that social science, social scientists agree that uh, rich democracies don't break down and old democracies don't break down. The United States is certainly a rich democracy. How old it is is a kind of matter of debate, but it's an old, certainly an old written constitution. In some ways, one might say it had it democratized only in the 1960s uh, with the passage of the Voting Rights and the Civil Rights Act. But in any case, the US is an old and rich democracy, which does make, given the past century of data, uh, democratic breakdown very unlikely in the U.S. Um, it, just looking at the past century of data. So uh, Daniel Treisman, political scientist at UCLA, actually has done some analysis where he takes those as the two predictor variables use, using the past century of data, says the probability of a democratic breakdown in the United States with the age and the wealth of the U.S. is 0. 0.0008. I think I got all the zeros there. So very low probability event. Yet, you know, we have experienced these, these, uh, these assaults. And so I think the best way to proceed is to sort of hold two contradictory pictures in our minds, which is that it's true that there are lots of sources of resilience in the U.S., but on the other hand, um, you know, we did experience these assaults and, you know, past, and this is not always, you know, simply the prologue of the future, and so I think we need to be very alert to the threats. So, I mean, on this question of, of resilience, um, one of the big points that this book has made is that the U.S. has experienced and survived threats to democracy in the past, right? So in the Reconstruction Era South, the, the Democratic Party had very authoritarian tendencies. You just talk about how Roosevelt attempted to concentrate executive power during the Depression. We had the McCarthy era, the Nixon era. Uh, and in each of these cases, the, the guardrails, as you put it, have held, right? So, you know, another question would be, what is different and more serious about the current threats to democracy that we are facing in the United States? And what do you say to people who might say that the U.S. has weathered these threats in the past and it's going to weather this threat as well? Um, so what would you say to, to that? First thing I would say is that we didn't weather all the threats. Um, Reconstruction failed. We, first of all, we, we, we broke down into civil war. And with the failure of Reconstruction, the United States, the, the United States South, and to some extent, the national regime slid into something that was less than democratic. The U.S. South was solidly authoritarian until the 1960s. Uh, so we weren't so resilient. 
Um, the, the, and I think that the current crisis is more similar to, um, to the crisis uh, in post-Civil War United States, post-Civil War South, than it is to, uh, than, than say the, the, the crisis in the 30s or the rise of McCarthyism. What we're, what we're seeing in the United States, in addition to extreme polarization, is a political party that, that represents a constituency that perceives itself to face an existential threat. Um, to, to, to put it bluntly, um, white Christians in the United States represented by the Republican Party perceive themselves to face an existential threat, as, as did um, uh, Southern whites, Southern Dem white Democrats in the South with the enfranchisement of African Americans in, in Reconstruction. And when a political party perceives itself to, to face an existential threat, um, it often plays dirty, it often radicalizes. And that's, that's what we're seeing. So the greatest comparison, I, I think, is to the period following the Civil War. And the, the ending was not happy. The, the guardrails didn't hold. We descended into, in the South at least, descended into, into authoritarian rule. And I, and I would add to this that, you know, the reason I mentioned before the age and, and wealth of a democracy somehow seem, at least in the data, seem to inoculate a democracy. But it's not age and wealth that themselves inoculate a, a democracy. The idea is that with, with age and wealth, it's presumed that a set of institutions and norms will develop. And those are the things that are actually doing the work. Um, and in particular, uh, it's presumed that you know, with an old democracy that's wealthy, it's presumed that you have political parties that are abiding by democratic norms and rules. And I think, the, from my perspective, the greatest vulnerability facing American democracy today is, in fact, a, a highly radicalized uh, um, party, uh, center-right party uh, that has, has in, in lots of respects, turned against uh, electoral democracy. And, and so, you know, when when and so this is something that is different from the post-war period in the United States. I mean, certainly there were strands, McCarthyism and so on, but at the kind of top of the party, uh, having a political party that has turned away. And, and actually, you know, there's, there's uh, data from varieties of democracy, this organization in Sweden, which codes parties in terms of how, uh, you know, their ideology and behavior in terms of their embrace of illiberalism and liberalism. And it's pretty clear the United States for most of the post-war period had, had a center-right party, just like Western Europe. But in recent years, the, the American Republican Party has gone off course and looks very different from the traditional uh, Christian Democratic and conservative parties of, of Western Europe. It looks much more like radical right parties of Western Europe in terms of its ideology, according to the varieties of democracy measures of this. And so what that and the, the reason that this is particular this leaves the US particularly vulnerable is that unlike in Europe, where these parties are kind of marginal parties for the most part. I mean, they're 20% of the electorate. France, you know, obviously was a slightly different case this last presidential election. But in the United States, we have a situation where we, one of our two major parties uh, looks like the kind of far right parties of Western Europe. And so it's hard to maintain a stable democracy in that kind of setting. And so what, what it leaves one with the feeling that each, nas each election is a kind of national emergency. And you, you can't maintain a democracy in a stable way that we expect when each national election feels like a national emergency. Yeah, so I, I want to pick up on this point that you mentioned with, with norms and sort of the importance of, of norms in, in supporting these democratic institutions uh, and sort of, you know, this fundamental paradox that we've had in the United States about how these norms often have rested on, on political exclusion. Um, so before, you know, elaborating that point, uh, I just, you know, would you, you know, one of the key points that you make is that these norms of political toleration and forbearance are so important to, to how democracy has functioned. Um, so, you know, can you just explain a little bit why it's so important to have these strong and formal norms when we do also have strong formal democratic institutions? So what are these norms? Why are they so important? Well, those institutions are strong in part because of the, the norms. And when the norms erode, the institutions can weaken pretty quickly. Uh, take the institution of, 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 uh, of elections in the United States. Once one party stops accepting, uh, routinely accepting electoral defeat, that institution suddenly becomes very, very precarious. So the two, two norms that we focus on are, uh, which we sort of consider master norms of democracy are, one you mentioned, mutual toleration, which is basically accepting the legitimacy of your rival, accepting uh, no matter how much you dislike or disagree with your partisan rival, you accept both in public and in private that they are a legitimate political force. They have every right to be out there doing politics, competing against us. And if they win, the right to govern us. 
Um, the second, a little more complicated, is what we call forbearance, which is simply uh, uh, not not uh, taking advantage of a of a of a position of authority to to use one's institutional prerogatives to the max. Every every formal rule, every constitution can be abused in what are essentially legal ways. This, this phenomena that scholars have called constitutional hardball, using the letter of the law in ways that subvert its spirit. Um, any rule, any, any formal rule can uh, has, has loopholes, has ambiguities, has multiple interpretations, and can be wielded in a way that subverts its spirit. And so a democracy, particularly one with a, a, a complex constitutional structure like the United States, relies on politicians' willingness not to deploy the, the letter of the law in ways that violate its spirit, not to go out, all out and uh, um, uh, say, refuse to, to, to take up a, a president's nominee for, uh, for the Supreme Court because you can. Um, and you know, for, for most of US history, our, our parties going back to the early 19th century through much of the 20th century, with the obvious exception of the Civil War, for most of our, of our history, the two major parties did accept one another and, uh, and, and play uh, um, and, and not abuse their institutional prerogatives. And so in that way, none of this is written down, it's all informal, um, but it, it's, it's the way that democracy works over time. The problem is those norms have eroded considerably in the last 20, 30 years. And I don't know if you wanted to, to add to yeah, that. No, that was, that was fine. Yeah, that's okay. So I, I want to get back to this point that you were, were raising a second ago in the sense that, so these norms that are so important to how democracy functions in the US, you point out that both parties have been guilty at different points historically of relying on political exclusion in order to uphold those norms. Right, so we, you talk in the book about how the Democratic Party after the Civil War um, felt very threatened by the enfranchisement of black voters. And it was only through Jim Crow laws uh, that Democrats felt secure enough in their uh, political party superiority to embrace these informal norms that are so fundamental. And now we have a Republican party, um, which also, which has predominantly become a party of, of white Christian voters that also feels threatened perhaps by political inclusion, demographic change. And that in large part is explaining why the Republican party is now undermining these norms. So, you know, this raises the central question of, is it possible to have both political inclusion and a strong democracy in the United States? And how do we do this if we have no historical success with achieving both of those goals? Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, that is the central question. I mean, that's the question that we're taking up in this book that we're working on now. Uh, and, you know, there, there's, I mean, I, I think there's two points, I guess I would make one that that just because these norms came about at the price of racial exclusion doesn't mean the norms themselves are in some way not critical. I mean, they are, and that's the kind of di dilemma of American democracy going back to the 19th century that uh, that you know mutual toleration is absolutely critical for democracy and as is as is forbearance uh, and it's it's just much easier to hold the you know to essentially tolerate your opponents if you don't feel existentially threatened by them and so what uh, you know what the period we're living through is one that's sort of testing these norms and so I you know I think one way to think about this is that kind of our our goal of a more inclusive democracy i mean part of the dilemma i think comes from our the nature of our institutions that our institutions themselves uh lock in minority uh political minorities and allow them to kind of gain power in ways uh that are kind of incompatible with democracy so i think part of the part of the dilemma comes from the nature of our of our institutions and that you know our you know, one of the points that we make in this work that we're working on now is that if we made our institutions more inclusive, perhaps in the short run, people would be you know, frightened by this. But I think at the end of the day, this might make our more democracy, our, our, our democracy work better and it would be a way of overcoming some of these dilemmas. And so, so the kind of solution is to democratize our democracy. Obviously, there's resistance to this, um, but that's sort of the nature of the, of the political game, which is to kind of form coalitions. And, and we could talk obviously a lot more about how one would, would actually get through these kind of difficult moments, but that's the central challenge of the age. But and I would like to talk about, sorry. Just to talk about one thing, uh, to, to build on what Daniel said, just be, it, there's no question that the exclusion of African-Americans and basically non-whites from the political community made it a lot easier 
for the two parties, basically white Protestant men leading both parties to, to operate with norms of, of, of mutual toleration and, and forbearance. The other side just wasn't that different. The other side just wasn't that scary. So making these, but that doesn't mean just because we haven't done it in the past, doesn't mean it's impossible to build similar or similarly effective norms in a multiracial context. It's true that this is uncharted territory. It's true that we haven't done it before. But to take one comparison, if you go back a little over 100 years in Europe, when the working classes hadn't entered politics and politics was basically an aristocratic uh, political community, people worried a lot about whether you know, political norms and political democracy could work in the constitutional rule could work in a, in a context of greater inclusion where workers could vote. And turns out you can do it, you can adapt. And I, I think it's, it's a similar process in, in terms of, of multiracial democracy. We need to, it, it's, it's, a, it's the challenge facing our polity in the, in the couple of decades to come. But um, I think particularly if you look at, at US cities, we're already learning at the micro level how to make multiracial democracy work. And, and one, one final thing is we don't really have an alternative. I mean, it's not, you know, we're already a highly diverse society. If we want to be democratic, the only way to deal with this is to move forward. And so, you know, sometimes I think, you know, politicians will kind of carry out a style of politics where they kind of imagine that we can go back to a style of politics where groups and are excluded. But, you know, we're a transformed society already, and it's only and our society is only getting more diverse. And so, it, you know, the, the question is how to, how to do it, not whether it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Yeah, so I think, you know, I'd like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on sort of how the conditions come about to, to bring about this kind of institutional change or, or realignment that, that you just alluded to. Um, I fully agree, it is, it is absolutely necessary. It also seems like a very tall order, right, in the sense that, you know, the, the book talks about sort of maybe two different paths forward, and I'd be curious to know if the, the latest book um, elaborates or changes these at all. But, you know, it seems like one path forward is um, that, you know, maybe there are more divisions that will emerge within the Republican Party, um, such that we see, might see more intra-party pressure to marginalize extremism, to, um, to pursue a more uh, pro-diversity agenda, to sort of reject Trumpism. Um, and I guess I would like to hear a little bit more from you about, you know, what conditions actually have, it, have to be in place? Um, how do the stars have to align to see perhaps those kinds of intra-party divisions? How likely are those conditions to come about? Um, so what would you, what do you say there? I think uh, Daniel will have probably more insights than me, but um, on that particular front, I mean, you're right, the, 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 the easiest way to reconsolidating our, the easiest path to reconsolidating American democracy is for is precisely what you said, Laura. For the Republican Party to reform itself, for a uh, a a more moderate or or uh, or demo pro democratic faction to uh, to to sort of establish control of the party, that seems a lot less likely today than when we wrote the book. When we wrote the book, we were actually fairly optimistic that there was a, a faction within the Republican Party, particularly within the in the Senate that would be capable of kind of drawing a line and, 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 and restraining Trump. And that did not happen there. Uh, the, the Trumpization of the Republican party was much more rapid and much more thoroughgoing than we imagined. When we wrote How Democracies Die, we did not characterize, the, we did not think the Republican party was a, an, a, an authoritarian party. We, wouldn't, we didn't use that language. Um, but the, the events of the last four or five years has, has forced us to revise that. So. What will it take? I think it's going to take uh, the political defeat of the MAGA-led Republican Party, which would require a broad coalition that goes beyond the Democratic Party, a broad, effectively multi-party coalition, to uh, which we haven't seen yet, to to defeat Trumpism, in effect. Yeah, I, I, and Steve said this would be the easiest way as a reform to take place. I think it's the actually the only way. The, the, the question is, because essentially you can't have a stable democracy with only one party committed to democratic rule. So ultimately, at the end of the day, this is going to be necessary. Um, and so the question is how to get there. And I think, it, you know, I think Steve is right, you know, and we expected it in some ways that this process would happen on its own or, you know, but I think the, the, it's that's not going to happen. That hasn't happened. 
you know, I, I sometimes think it's useful to think in sort of short run and long run kind of uh, categories here. I mean, in the short run, I think that the, the point that Steve made is absolutely right. There needs to be broad coalitions looking forward to the 2022 elections, 2024 elections um, to isolate uh, authoritarians. Um, and and you know, so that that's that's absolutely critical. I mean, and, you know, but that's that's not, you know, that's OK in the short run, but I'm not sure if that's a long run solution, because ultimately, you know, at some point, democracy is premised on competition. The other side should have a chance to win and to gain power and to compete and to win and so on. And so how do we make sure that when, uh, you know, when Democrats lose elections, they don't think that, you know, the world's coming to an end because that's no way to run a democracy. And so I think the, the kind of longer run solution and I think a way of accelerating the process of transformation is this kind of process of institutional reform. And so, you know, and this is, you know, there's lots of institutions that one could think about reforming in the US and to make our national democracies, well, state democracies more uh, democratic, uh, you know, things that we've talked about um, and that are being talked about by lots of people, you know, reforming the electoral college, uh, reforming the filibuster, uh, things that allow for more, essentially more majoritarian rule in a, in a sense, uh, I, I think are really critical to use the tools of, elect of the kind of electoral marketplace to make sure to kind of activate the mechanisms of the electoral marketplace, because it's, I think, through competition that, you know, if Republicans had to compete, let's say if, Republican, if a Republican presidential candidate had to win a majority of the popular vote in order to win the presidency, they would have to reach out to different kinds of voters. They would have to run in different states. They'd have to run in California, run in New York to, to appeal to different ty types of voters. And this would, this, would, this would lead to moderation. The problem is in our current institutional setup, there's no incentives to do that. And the, all the incentives are in fact the opposite because there's a base pushing it to radicalize and the kind of countervailing force of our institutions are not moderating. So I think over the long run, not only is democratizing our democracy good for democracy inherently, it also has the, the kind of knock-on effect, I, it, I would, we would argue, that of, of uh, moderating the Republican Party potentially. So it's, I think it's very interesting because these kinds of institutional reforms that you're, you're talking about, so one of the other points that you make in the book is that you know, how important it is for pro-democracy forces, the Democratic Party, to play by what is perceived as the current rules of the game. Because if it takes too many steps that are perceived to be um, undermining existing democratic institutions, that will just further polarize uh, and it will further politicize um, the, the situation right now. So, you know, that kind of institutional reform, you know, getting rid of the, the filibuster, reforming the electoral college, switching to ranked choice voting in different places, you know, how can, how can that line be walked so that that doesn't look like further politicization? And it actually, it seems like it would require bipartisan support to bring these kinds of institutional reforms around. So how, how can we walk that balance? Do you want to answer that, Steve? Or? I, I'll, I'll answer. I, I think I think it's not a contradiction at all. I mean, I, th I mean, I understand the tension that you're talking about, uh, but I, I think it's important to kind of distinguish between legitimate institutional reform. Uh, democracies do this all the time, uh, and and reforms that are used to entrench one party in power. What what I, what I am suggesting is that we need reforms to introduce more competition, uh, and you know certainly you know the. the you know, reforming the filibuster will be portrayed by the, whoever's not in power as a power grab or, or something like this. Uh, that you know, that's just the nature of, of politics that people make these act, make these kinds of claims. But you know, I, I think we need to kind of have. It's really important to to have kind of the criteria of what counts. What is a democracy? Uh, in anything that increases voter participation, anything that increases part uh, competition is pro democratic. And so to, to, to kind of push for, let's say, for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or any kind of voting bill that increases voter turnout, you know, we can't call that a power grab. That, that's, called, that's called democracy. It's more participation. It's only viewed as a power grab if you want fewer people to vote, which is non-democratic. So I, so I think if, if as long as the reforms align with our kind of basic criteria of, of, dem, of kind of our criteria of what it counts means to be a democracy, then they're fair game and legitimate. And they you know, it's, they may, if, you know, ideally these kinds of things would be bipartisan given the nature of our institutions. It's hard to imagine constitutional amendments that aren't bipartisan uh, in order to get the requisite uh, super majorities. Um, you know, in American history, that hasn't always been the case, I should add. I mean, the 14th amendment passed without a single vote from either a uh, Southern Democrat or a Northern Democrat, entirely partisan. 
And I would suggest probably in, everybody sitting here on this call today would say, you know, if we would we wait around for bipartisanship before we get the 14th Amendment, would we all not want the 14th Amendment today? Of course, the 14th Amendment was a good thing, even if it was done in a partisan way. Ideally, these things can be done in a bipartisan way, but sometimes they, they, they simply can't be done in that way. So, um, you know, I think that's, again, it's a, the main thing is, are these reforms pro-democratic or not? So I want to go back to this uh, point that you just mentioned about sort of the importance of building broad coalitions, pro-democracy coalitions that encompass progressives, that encompass moderates within the Republican Party, perhaps the private sector, religious leaders. Um, you know, and I would have said that that is a seems like a very tall political um, order. However, we did just see something like this in the recent elections in Hungary, where you had opposition parties from across the political spectrum uniting, albeit unsuccessfully, behind a, a single candidate to, to try to oust uh, Viktor Orban. And I just wanted to ask, you know, uh, in the interest of comparison, are there lessons that can be learned from cases like Hungary or, you know, other efforts to build these kinds of broad coalitions that could instruct how we might do that here, the, the conditions under which that might come about? Sure, there are lessons we have to be careful to, to note some of the differences between Hungary and, and the United States. Um, one thing that's important to be clear on, efforts to oppose auth authoritarians, particularly successful and relatively entrenched authoritarians like Orban, usually fail. The op oppositions in, in authoritarian regimes like Hungary are fighting an uphill battle. They are fighting in a, in a, uh, on an uneven playing field. In the case, of Hungary, one in which the bulk of the private sector and nearly all of the media was working for the ruling Fidesz party. So we we shouldn't conclude uh, from one instance, uh, because the, the opposition coalition did not work in Hungary. It's hard. It's hard to build a coalition that ranges from left to right and sustain it against, uh, particularly against somebody who controls as many resources as Orban. So one lesson is that we should not, we should not conclude from one failed instance of opposition mobilization against an autocrat, that that strategy doesn't work. Most efforts, mo in, it takes multiple rounds to defeat an autocrat, the best of cases. Um, usually the first punch doesn't, doesn't bring down the autocrat. And so a failure in one round is not, shouldn't be generalized to say, no, nah, broad coalitions don't work because it didn't work in Hungary. In addition, the US case is very different. The Hungarian opposition is pretty weak. It, it, it's, it's not electorally very strong, it's not well organized, doesn't have a lot of resources. Um, the US opposite, one, one advantage the US has is, first of all, we're not an authoritarian regime, there's still a, a level playing field. And second of all, the, um, the opposition, the, Dem the small D Democrats, it, you know, I include here Liz Cheney, not just the, the Democratic Party, are are strong. They're they're well organized. They have an electorally viable party. They're they're already the bulk of the opposition is already unified in a single party, the Democratic Party. Um, lots of resources, well organized, electorally viable, and so the 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 up all the all the opposition in the United States has to do is extend the coalition a little further. It's it's a lot less work. It's a heavier. It's a lighter lift than the Hungarians had to face. Um, but still, it, it is essential. We know from uh, many, many other cases across history that when democratic forces do not unite in the face of authoritarian threats, when they let short-term political ambitions or policy differences or ideological differences or political identity differences get in the way of closing ranks in the face of an authoritarian threat, democracy is in trouble. It's really critical that everyone from AOC to Liz Cheney line up and, and act collectively to, to oppose this authoritarian threat. Daniel's right. This is a short-term solution. It's not a long-term solution, but um, the short-term is, is quite pressing right now. And I would just, one, one point to add to all of that, um, that the, the kind of fractiousness of the opposition, I mean, this is one of the things that makes it so that, as Steve says, this often fails, that there's the, the internal divisions within the opposition. Authoritarians benefit from that, and they foment that. And so I think a thing to really be alert to is to, to, to these internal divisions and to realize that they are kind of often a sideshow to the main battle, which in the main political struggle, which is to oust an authoritarian, let's say in the case of Hungary. So, um, you know, so 
you know, somebody like Viktor Orban, you know, that this was his a big part of his strategy was to to foment divisions within the opposition. And, uh, you know, I think it, it, obviously the U.S. Were in, a, were in a democratic situation, a totally different situation. But on, as Steve said, but on, you know, but one does also see that there's, in, there's internal divisions on these questions and people kind of get distracted, I think, by side issues. And, you know, one of the, and, and then, you know, as the, the playing field gets tilted further and further, the opposition has to get bigger and bigger to win. You know, so Viktor Orban's opposition couldn't just get 50% of the vote. They had to get even more because of the rigged, you know, the way in which the electoral districts are drawn. And so the, so the more tilted the playing field, the more entrenched the incumbent, the bigger the opposition has to be, the bigger the coalition, the more fragile it is, and the more prone it is to these kinds of divisions. And so that's a, there's a kind of warning in that, which is that, you know, you don't, if you wait too long, the opposition has to be so big that it's incredibly difficult to sustain it. And so, again, focusing on the kind of unifying um, uh, themes and things that bring these groups together is really the most important thing. Um, thank you. So I want to ask a little bit about the American voter, right? So much of the book really focuses on sort of elite level politics, but obviously there's also a very important role for voters and for, for public opinion. Um, you know, we have a recent series of polls by Drutman et al. that show that 87% of Americans say that a democratic political system is a good way of governing the country and that there's really only um, a minority who are open to authoritarian alternatives. Um, but at the same time, preserving democracy does not seem like an issue that's at the forefront um, of what Americans are voting on right now, at least uh, relative to other social or economic issues. Um, so, you know, first question is, what do you think is going on with American voters? Is it the fact that many voters are really not aware of the, the threat that democracy is facing in the United States right now? Perhaps they see it as more of a distant threat like climate change, which we know makes it harder to, to mobilize and, and galvanize people. Um, or is it that voters really do understand the threat? We're just so polarized that we're kind of incapable of coming together and, and addressing it effectively. So I'm curious to know, you know, which of those do you think better characterizes the American electorate right now? And is it possible, you know, what do we have to do to actually mobilize American voters from both parties to, to vote on the basis of this issue, um, even when, you know, we might have really big policy differences on, on other issues? It's really hard. This is why we focus on elites. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, there, are, there are very, very few cases um, where, where sort of voters have led the charge in, in, in pursuit or defense of democratic institutions. The, um, procedures, rules and procedures are very, very rarely at the top of voters' minds. And only where people lose their democracy and are faced with a Pinochet or a Franco or, a, uh, uh, or you know, the Argentine Junta in the 1970s, then you may get a moment in which a, the, a, a, a real critical mass of citizens puts democracy first, but it's, it almost never happens. I mean, that 87% poll, I mean, that's meaningless. That's like asking, do you, do you love America? I mean, people, everyone has their own, I, everyone knows that democracy is a good thing. People have a different conception of what democracy is. Republican, you know, their poll, most polls today show that Republican voters are actually more concerned about the, the, the state of our democracy than Democratic voters, because re most Republican voters think that the 2020 election was stolen and we have an illegitimate president. Um, so it's, it's very, very difficult that it, it, we're, we're given the level of polarization, we're not gonna see people rallying around, at least not that they may rally around democracy in name or in, or in principle, but never in practice. And there's a lot of research by Milan, Milan Folic and others that show that no matter what we say in a poll about our support of democracy, in a polarized context, the vast majority of, of, uh, of committed vote, of ideologically committed voters are going to choose that they're gonna choose party and, and, and policy over defense of democracy. I mean, they will tolerate, a in a polarized context, they will tolerate authoritarian abuse by their own side in order to in order to win, and that that's that's a finding that's robust. It's not just the United States; it's it, it's everywhere. So, I don't think as you know, to try to educate people, but in a polarized context, I would not 
rely on the electorate to save our democracy. Yeah, I, 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 I really agree with that. It's hard to add anything to that, except the one thing I would say is that there are domains where individual action matter a great deal. Um, you know, and this, this is, you know, really, especially when one when one's faced with an authoritarian incumbent, you know, how does one behave, you know, in that kind of context? And I think one of the great sources of strength for democracy are uh, in civil society, of course, but even more specifically, professions. So in other words, people doing their jobs, abiding by professional eth and a professional ethos. So whether and so during the Trump administration, I think one of the great sources of strength in American of American democracy were, were lawyers abiding by kind of uh, you know bar uh, uh, bar association uh, ethical standards. You know, going into uh, uh, airports to you know help out immigrants who are trying to figure out how to deal with their immigration status. Uh, military officers not willing to inst you know to follow us an, an immoral com uh, command. Um, uh, public health officials, uh, meteorologists. I don't know if you all remember that sort of case where uh, President Trump was trying to claim that the hurricane was going one way when it was actually going another or something. So it's essentially people abiding by their professional ethos and doing their job, you know, and acting ethically. You know, that seems like a small thing to do, but, you know, authoritarians uh, are intimidated by this. I mean, this is a source of, because it, it kind of abiding by a professional ethos in a way inoculates you from the temptations of corruption and gives you courage in the face of harassment. Um, and so that, that's absolutely critical for a democracy. So, so it's, not, it's not that citizen action doesn't matter, but I think I, I agree with Steve that, you know, mobile voters, you know, have all sorts of motivations and the job of a democracy is to deliver for its citizens and to, and to, pro to provide effective governance and citizens then will reward a democracy, you know, and, and so I think one of the, a big threat to democracy is dysfunction um, and, and essentially not delivering on the promises that governments make. And so I, th I think that's, that's in some ways a bigger threat that, than people, you know, people sort of general abstract statements about whether or not they believe in democracy. I'm being told I have time for, for one more question. And I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, you know, obviously a lot has changed since the book came out in 2018. And I wanted to hear, um, you know, you know, what has changed about your predictions or your optimism, and pessimism. That's not the question I'm going to ask, though. Um, but I'll leave that in case you have, have time. Uh, but I do want to ask about sort of the global geopolitical threats that we're, we're facing from democratic erosion, right? So obviously the, the world has watched the Russian invasion of Ukraine with, with horror. And I think it really brings home sort of the dangers of democratic erosion, both in the sense that you know, this is clear evidence of what democratic erosion in Russia, authoritarianism in Russia under Vladimir Putin, what the consequences of that are. Um, but this also suggests that, you know, democratic erosion in the U.S. and Western Europe, you know, can also have consequences for, for geopolitical stability. So I just thought, I was hoping, you know, maybe you could comment a little bit about, you know, to what extent do you see democratic erosion here or globally as really leading to the kinds of geopolitical instability that we're seeing now in, in Eastern Europe and, and how might we see this uh, unfurl in the years to come? Yeah, I, I would say that it's, it's, you know, it's unclear whether Russia was ever a democracy. Um, but certainly authoritarianism in Russia is, is poses global, has consequences for geopolitics. And, you know, there's some great research which shows that personalistic dictatorships are more likely to invade countries and start wars uh, than any other kind of regime. And I think in many ways, Putin's, Putin's regime is a highly personalistic dictatorship. I was on a panel recently where somebody was saying, oh, you know, this whole thing is all very predictable. Putin wrote this essay like two years ago, laying out what he was going to do, and then he just did it. And, you know, I, I sort of was thinking to myself, like, I, you know, I write my essays and I struggle to get my students to even read them. And here's somebody who can just write an essay and then get the entire machinery of the government to implement his vision. It's a highly personalistic regime that, um, may, that had lots of intelligence failures as a result of that, you know, overestimated his strength uh, and so on. And so then we now see the global consequences of that. And, so, and, and, and you know, I think when you think of bombs falling on, on the homes of Ukrainians and children having to flee, I mean, this is, there's a no, no, no more vivid display of the use of arbitrary power. And so I, I think one of the, you know, in some ways that this, I, I think certainly in Europe, this is the case to some degree in the US, there's a kind of greater appreciation, I think, of democracy, I would say, because one sees the kind of pitfalls of arbitrary power. I think a difference between Europe, having spent some time in Germany over the last uh, couple of months, that because the threat is so much more existential for Europeans, that, you, you know, it's these attacks and bom dropping of bombs is taking place, you know, a couple hours from Berlin, you know, a couple hundred miles from Berlin, that, that this is really altering 
both political systems and people's understandings of the nature of, of politics within their own countries. And so, you know, German politics is being fundamentally transformed by this war. Whereas in the U.S., you know, there was some talk early on that, well, you know, maybe the, you know the Republican this is going to you know change the Republican Party. They're going to kind of go back to their Cold War status. I you know of being kind of uh, you know, hawks on national security and so on. And it's unclear, I think, whether that's actually happened or not. I mean, this, this is not kind of altering, so far at least, the kind of basic contours of American politics. And I think it's partly because it's it's much further away. And so people on their daily lives don't feel the same kind of existential threat that Europeans do. I could just say two things very quickly. Um, one, you know, inevitably, I think, there's been a, a, a far-reaching geopolitical change over the last 30 years. The, the, uh, the brief window in which the liberal West was darn near hegemonic in the world in the 1990s was, was a great period for democracy. Really, you know, Western style institutions between 1989 and 2003 were really the only game in town with a, with a few regional exceptions. And those days are over. Those days were always going to be over. They're inevitably over the, 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 the inexorable expansion of of China, the very likely uh, recovery of, of, of Russia, the, 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 the emergence of a more multipolar world in which some of those poles are anti-West and illiberal and probably anti-liberal, that, that, that's a, unfortunately a fact of life that, that we're gonna have to grapple with for decades to come. And that's probably gonna be challenging for global democracy. I don't think there was, I don't, I'm, not, I'm really not sure there was any avoiding of that. That said, I actually think that, um, as, as Daniel alluded, the invasion of, of Ukraine, as horrible, horrible as it is for Ukrainians and for Europe and, and possibly for global peace, I, I think is probably given a bit of a breather to the liberal West. I mean, uh, the infatuation, the, 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 the illiberal right in the West, which has been emerging and uh, somewhat infatuated with Putin, I mean, that, is, that has been given a knockback. The, the world is getting a lesson, as Daniel pointed out, in the, the, not only the, the nastiness, but the, uh, the cost of, in terms of poor decision-making uh, of having a dictatorship. Um, the personalist dictatorships can make some really, really bad decisions. And at, by, I'm not an expert on Russian foreign policy or, or, or war in Europe, but it seems to me that the world has just seen a pretty spectacularly bad decision made by, by Putin. And I think that actually um, is gonna give a bit of a breather to the liberal West. Um, thank you so All much. Right. I am now gonna let other people ask questions. Thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> uh, this is going great. So we do have a, a long list of, of questions here that have come in from uh, the audience and, and we're gonna get to a few of them here. Uh, the first one is from Stephen Plotkin. Uh, who says, given the high likelihood that many state secretaries of state for the 2024 election will be those who deny the legitimacy of the 2020 election, and with new laws allowing state legislatures to decide which slate of electors to send forward, what should we be doing to protect the 2024 election? Oof. <laughs> you want that one? Sure. Well, to... yeah, I mean, it's a serious threat. I mean, we, we've written about this uh, in the Atlantic a couple, couple months ago, or I guess six months ago or something, um, or a few months ago anyway. Uh, and I mean, I think it is, there is a genuine threat of, of a genuinely stolen election in, uh, in uh, 2024 along these lines. Um, I, I, I guess two things. One, it's not a given that, that the, the, how these elections for secretaries of state will turn out. I mean, I think there's, you know, for instance, in in Georgia and other places, you know, there's there's you know competing there's pri people being primaried, Republicans being primaried by more kind of MAGA secretaries of state, and that's a great that's a great threat. Uh, I, I mean, one thing I would say is that you know everybody listening should really be paying attention in, uh, to those elections. I mean, in a way, we sort of in American politics we've tended to think you know everything that happens in D.C. and whatever is happening in the Senate is the most important thing, but it may turn out these elections taking place in places uh, like Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia for secretaries of state may be the kind of most thing, important thing to focus on. And so, you know, whether one's giving money or attention or mobilizational aid, it's, you know, focusing on what's happening in the states is, is really important. That's one thing. A second thing I would say is that there is, and there continues to be, as far as I know, efforts to reform the Electoral Count Act, uh, which you know, which is this old law from the, the 18 the end of the 19th century, um, 
to kind of uh, which governs the process of how the electors uh, uh, get validated and so on. Uh, and so I think you know there's efforts to kind of make that system more immune from the kind of interventions that potentially could derail things in 2024. So I think those efforts, people should you know pay attention to those efforts and push those efforts along to the degree they can. Okay, Steve, do you want to add anything to that or should we move on? Just very quickly, um, what we can do is raise awareness of the potential for a, a, a stolen election. It's, it's easier to get away with stealing an election if nobody's expecting it than if people are talking about it, if the media is talking about it, if politicians are talking about it, that makes it harder to do. Secondly, as always, um, mobilizing the votes, um, get, get helping people to vote in some states, and, and mobilizing the vote is, is always central in, in, in preserving a democracy. And third, be ready to mobilize. Um, if, if there is a stolen election, it's going to take, uh, it's gonna take civic mobilization to defend our democracy, peaceful civic mobilization. Thanks a lot. So the next one is a, a very straightforward and, and somewhat provocative question. Uh, Richard Lichen asks, has not the Democratic Party also become more radicalized? For the most part, no. Um, studies, uh, two, two things have, have happened. Um, the parties have, have become much more ideologically pure. If you go back to the middle of the 20th century, our parties were really, really weird creatures. The Democratic Party had a liberal wing, sort of as always, in, the, in mostly in the Northeast, and it had a really conservative wing in the South, which is a big part of the party. The Republicans had a conservative wing as it does now, and they had a, a relatively liberal wing in, in the North. There were sort of center, center left Republicans. The parties have realigned in a way that um, all the conservatives are in the Republican party and all the liberals are in the Democratic party. And the loss, the defection of the South, of Southern conservatives from the Democratic party to the Republican party, has made the Democratic Party more homogeneously liberal. That is true. Another thing that's happened is as the country has grown more socially liberal on some areas, particularly, I think most prominently, gay rights, uh, the party has moved to the left. So under Bill Clinton, you know, the Democratic Party leadership wouldn't even entertain the idea of gay marriage. Obviously, American views have shifted dramatically uh, in, in, in that on that issue. And the Democratic Party has moved, if you want to call it, left on the issue of, of say, gay rights, similar with, with race and, and with feminism. But all of that said, there are a lot, there are studies, Daniel mentioned VDEM, there are studies of congressional roll call voting. There's a lot of data to suggest that the Republican Party's radicalization has been much more extreme than that of the Democratic Party. And let me just add to be really clear about this. You know, there's two different ways in which a party can radicalize. One is on policy questions. Do they move to the left or to the right? You know, that and that I think that's like fair game in a democracy. You can be on the right. You can be on the left. You can really vehemently disagree on these kinds of policy questions that, that uh, Steve has just talked about. I think the kind of radicalization that, that we were talking about, or at least that I meant when we were talking when we were talking about this, is a radicalization on the dimension of democracy itself. Do you accept the rules of the democratic game? Do you uh, condone violence or do you explicitly condemn violent political violence, the effort to use violence to hold on to office? You know, and there, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, during Black Lives Matter protests, you know, democratic politicians, there was, you know, some democratic politicians somewhere who said, well, we can understand why people are upset and, and that sort of condoning violence. I think that's a, of a very different quality. I mean, it's sort of political science, uh, po politicians playing armchair sociologists, which is, you know, which is, it, which is different than having national political leaders uh, not explicitly condemn efforts to use violence to hold on to power. And that's, and that's what happened with January 6th. I, I think we just haven't seen the, thankfully, haven't seen the equivalent kind of thing on the left. It's not to say the left is not vulnerable to that. I mean, if you look at Weimar Germany, in Weimar Germany, that, that's why that regime collapsed, is that you had forces on the right and the left taking up arms to try to gain power. And thankfully in the US that we haven't seen this on the side of the Democratic Party. So I think it's, you know, so it's important again to just make this key distinction about what we mean exactly by radicalization. Thank you. So the next one is from Carl von Zabern, uh, probably butchered that, I apologize, Carl. Uh, 
He says, how do you respond to scholars like Hacker and Pearson who also place the blame uh, on the conservative party, but uh, instead, but you know, also focus on money in politics? Do you see these as complementary ideas or competing ones? Uh, I, I see them as complementary. I mean, I, clearly money is a, a, a big issue. Um, you know, the, the con concern, I think we both, we agree with Hacker and Pearson that, that, that there's a kind of been a radicalization exactly in the way that I've just described on the behalf of Republicans. Uh, it's a kind of particular electoral strategy. Uh, it's exacerbated by inequality. Um, and, you know, I think as our society becomes more unequal and as it becomes more diverse, this provides, you know, outstanding raw materials for demagogues to try to blame uh, outsiders or different groups for people's bad economic conditions. And so I think these two factors kind of come together in a very potent mix. I mean, one thing I would say, though, is that the role of money in politics, you know, it did, did, doesn't just happen automatically. It's a result, in, in fact, of court decisions, uh, you know, in particular, the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. And so I think one way to understand why we got the court decision that we got with that case, it, and this reflects in some ways, uh, many years of a kind of, uh, of a Supreme Court that reflects and in effect minority views. And so I think in a way, one can blame our institutions for giving us the situation, giving us the circum these kinds of decisions. And so, you know, if we had a different process of, let's say, you know, how people, you know, the people who nominate the presidents or the, the, the Supreme Court justices or presidents who are elected through the Electoral College, they're confirmed by senators who overrepresent certain state, you know, small states. And so in a way, we get the court that we get because of our institutions. And so that's why at the end of the day, I think the, the role of money in some ways, it reflects the nature of our institutions, which again comes back to this point that I think we've made a couple of times now that we need to reform our institutions. There, there are many ways to die. And uh, the fact that, 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 that we focus on uh, sort of the, 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 on race and the reaction, the authoritarian reaction to multiracial democracy does in no way uh, preclude that the role of money in politics and particularly rising inequality wasn't also doing serious damage to, to our democratic institutions. And we have slight differences with Hacker and Pearson. They, they pay more attention to the role of plutocrats in, in sort of uh, radicalizing the party from above. And we pay a bit more attention to sort of base level radicalization, but both things can, and I think are going on. Thank you. So the next, that's actually the, some of y'all's responses uh, are a good segue here. Uh, the next one is from Gabriel Ortiz, who is uh, from Venezuela, uh, and he's studying human rights at the law school here. Uh, and he uh, says, uh, he's, he's seen how Maduro maintained his power after losing in 2015 by manipulating the Supreme Court. Uh, and he wants to know how important it is, uh, from your perspective, for a stable democracy to preserve an independent and impartial judicial branch. Very important. There, it, it is not an accident that in almost every case of electoral authoritarianism, where, in, within, where a, an autocrat is elected within a democratic system and then proceeds to try to undermine democracy. In almost any case you can think of or identify, certainly in the 21st century, the first move is to go after uh, the, 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 the referees, to go after public prosecutors, courts, um, FBI, to try to control the areas of, of law enforcement and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the judiciary. Uh, because that does two things. It allows an autocrat to protect oneself from, from investigation, to shield oneself. And it gives, and crucially, most importantly, certainly in Venezuela, it gives the autocrat a, a very powerful weapon to, uh, to legally assault, undermine, weaken opponents. And uh, Maduro did that uh, with, a, with a court that was already packed by Hugo Chavez. He, he had a, a packed court ready to go. But um, this is the first move of almost every autocrat because controlling the judiciary is, is, is essential to consolidating authoritarian rule. So the flip side of that is, yes, agree completely with, with Gabriel that um, maintaining an independent judiciary is critical, not only to defending individual rights, but to, but to maintaining an e a, a level playing field in a democratic regime. 
Daniel, would you add to that? Uh, no, that's okay. okay. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, just two more questions, guys. Uh, and then the first of those two is, uh, do you think religion or spirituality in general positively influence democratic norms through enhancing toleration and non-materialistic mindsets, or does religion have a reverse effect? Thanks, they say. I think it has both effects. Uh, I mean, the, the roots of the very notion of mutual toleration are, are, are come out of a kind of notion of religious toleration. Um, and, uh, you know, the wars of religion in Europe in the 17th century and the idea that, you know, we, we may disagree, uh, but we're going to cope with it uh, and allow the other person to kind of pursue their own faith. In many ways, that's a kind of uh, precursor to the kind of political toleration that's necessary for democracy. And, and the habit of doing that, I think, in fact, in the religious domain, arguably, one might imagine, leads, makes it easier to do that in the political uh, domain. Um, that said, religious intolerance also exists and continues to exist. And so I think in many ways that the, uh, the religion is a powerful tool of mo mobilization and a powerful source of identity. And so, uh, you know, when, when politics gets organized around identity, uh, that identities that are in some ways kind of regarded as, as mutually exclusive, uh, this can be very dangerous. And so, you know, look, look to what's happening in India right now, where I think much of the democratic backsliding in India today is, is rooted in a Hindu nationalism uh, uh, targeted against Muslim citizens. Um, and, you know, so I think in this replays itself as well as in Poland and in Hungary over the last 10 years. I mean, a lot of the mobilization of Viktor Orban as well as uh, the Polish right have been about defending a national community defined by its religion. So religion has these contradictory effects that both are important and conducive for democracy, but also uh, can be used as, as dangerous tools. Glad you mentioned India because uh, one of our our students had a question about that, and and so now I'll I'll skip over that that one and and just offer one final question. Uh, who is from uh, Andrew Skernick, who is actually one of my personal students this semester, and and he's going to ask you a question that uh, he's heard my perspective on. I'll I'll be interested to hear yours. Uh, you guys have have mentioned the electoral college, or at least alluded to it tonight. Uh, do you actually think it's possible? Uh, to discard the Electoral College in, in favor of a national popular vote um, or something? Uh, if so, how? Um, Daniel may have a more insightful answer. The, uh, the, answer, the, the question has to be answered on two levels. Obviously, it is politically um, almost unthinkable today to, to eliminate the Electoral College because it requires a constitutional reform and we're nowhere near in a, in a highly polarized context with two disciplined parties, we're nowhere near having the votes to, to, to approach that. So from a sort of standard short-term political analysis, electoral college reform is not on the table right now. That said, it's really important to, beginning, to begin having this conversation. Uh, one, one issue with, with American institutions, we are deeply attached for better and worse, to our country's founding institutions, which many of which are pre-democratic institutions and function as undemocratic institutions. Um, but we take many of our institutions, because they've been around so long, we take them for granted. We take them as immovable objects. Sometimes we treat them as, as near biblical because you know, they were designed by the founding fathers. They must be, by definition, best practice across all contexts. That's ridiculous. Um, anybody who studies comparative politics knows that institutions that function well in one social or historical or, or economic context may be utterly dysfunctional in another context. Um, a, so an institution that seemed plausible in the 18th century may not, and in fact does not, work very well in the 21st century. So we need to begin in, to, to have this conversation. We need to begin a public debate about uh, about this change in order to, to, to we don't just, you can't, you, it, it's very self-destructive to say, well, that's not politically feasible, so let's not talk about it. That, that's, a, that's a recipe for failure. Um, it's better to say, let's begin to talk about it. Uh, let's write op-eds about it. Let's have a public debate about it. 
and that, that's the first step towards making it politically feasible. Yeah, so I'll just quickly two two things. You know, one um, I was I was just reading today Alex Kisar's wonderful book on the history of the Electoral College in the United States, and you know, and people all too often forget in 1969. 80, the American Bar Association made the case for limiting the Electoral College, passed the House of Representatives. You had a Senate majority uh, for the elimination of the Electoral College. President, Nick, uh, President Nixon had indicated he would sign a bill, or I guess he didn't need to do this as a constitutional amendment, but he was pushing, he was pushing for this as well. 85% um, approval for this, and it was blocked by a filibuster. Uh, you know, those are different times, but that's not that long ago. And so political configurations can emerge in unexpected ways and suddenly something that seems very unlikely can become possible. And so to kind of build on Steve's point there, I think it's really important to have a model of politics in our mind that it, politics is not just one stream, you know, it's sort of like what's going on in MSNBC when we turn it on and, you know, thinking about the next elections and then the 2024 elections and this kind of continuous stream. Politics actually exists of multiple streams. There's multiple things happening at the same time. I mean, we can be thinking in the short run and at the same time, there's debates happening all the time about what are the pro appropriate policy ideas, what are our goals, how do we achieve our goals, and if we're not having that second debate, if that second stream isn't, isn't taking place, then when the moment comes along where there's an opportunity, uh, that nothing will happen. And so I think, you know, what, what happened, the way that politics actually works is major change happens when these streams join and these happen often unexpectedly. And so we have to be ready with the proposals on the shelf so that the moment the opportunity is there, people can push ahead. And so I think, again, to just to reiterate this point, we need to continue to have these discussions because because politics is a, a, in part about agenda setting. And that's what, in a sense, what we're arguing for. Terrific, thanks a lot. So uh, with that, uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and let y'all off the hook. Uh, I think I speak for, Everybody, when I express my extreme gratitude to you both uh, for your time uh, and for sharing your thoughts on, on where democracy uh, has uh, been going wrong and, and what we might do to preserve it, uh, both here and abroad, I think we're all edified tremendously. Uh, thank you also, Professor Paler, uh, for your excellent questions tonight. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you in the audience for your attention uh, and your great questions as well. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll bid you all a, a good night, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the fall. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank yep. you.